Well, Mission Hills, it is so great to be back with you all. It has been a long time since I got to be here in the pulpit. Um, I haven't been here since May, and uh, I am thrilled to be able to be here. And before I start, I want to say I've been wrestling with my voice all day, so I have this tea, and uh, so if I drink of it, I promise there's tea in here. So um, that's it's been a good morning. So. But, um, but yeah, I am thrilled to be back. And I know there's a lot of people who are here new since I've been here last. Uh, my name is Reza Zadeh. I get to be one of the teaching pastors here. And uh, throughout the summer, uh, my wife and I, my family, we serve with an organization called Campus Crusade, which is now called Crew, and a little slice of Crew called Athletes in Action. So we kind of spend summers working with athletes of all ages and doing outreaches and camps and just kind of stuff that we do, utilizing this platform of sport to communicate the gospel of Jesus. And uh, I don't know if you knew this, but a couple of weeks ago, there was a pretty big sporting event um, that happened in Tokyo. And I don't know about you or your family or how you experience the Olympics. We love the Olympics. Like it is all over our house. We've got the medal count going on in our house with a chart. And I mean, we love it. And uh, here's what I love about the Olympics, not just the competition, but I love that people from every tribe, every nation, every language come together for, for a common purpose which kind of sounds very biblical, bringing people together from every tribe, every country, every language, being together in one place. It's pretty awesome. And I love the stories. If you watch in the evening, you know, NBC does the stories, the videos about the stories of the athletes, where they're from, kind of what they've, how they've overcome. And I love watching those. But I also love digging a little deeper and finding the stories of faith, which typically aren't on mainstream media, but finding athletes that, that know Jesus, finding athletes that utilize their sport as a springboard to communicate about Jesus. And not just American athletes, but athletes around the world. Uh, I posted a number of those stories on my Instagram and the social media. So if you're interested in finding out more about some of those athletes, I would encourage you to do that. And one of the things my wife and I are still doing, we still are gonna be serving um, this, this fall as a chaplain with the Denver Broncos. And so I'd ask that you would pray with us as we reach and encourage athletes and their wives, girlfriends, fiancés um, to meet, learn what it means to follow Jesus. So here's the cool thing I love. No matter where I go, I feel the presence of Mission Hills with me. And I'm thankful that we are on mission together, learning what it means to follow Jesus. Well, if you've been with us this summer and I've been following along online, we're in a series um, in this New Testament letter called Galatians. And it was a letter that was written by a man named Paul. And he just wrote it to a specific group of people in a little town called Galatia. And we've been taking a look at this series, which we have called Live Free, because the idea of Galatians really is all about what does it mean to have freedom in Christ? What does it mean for us to experience spiritual and relational and emotional freedom because of the gospel? And the series Live Free has helped us examine just a little bit the gap that we experience because we as followers of Jesus, we have this expectation because we're told and we read in scripture that as we come to Jesus, there's this expectation that we're gonna experience freedom in all these areas that I just mentioned. But unfortunately, our experience doesn't always match our expectation. We have an expectation of freedom, but the, our experience, there seems to be a gap. And so Paul actually talks about this gap and he talks about why that gap is there. So today I'm gonna to wrap up this series and I just got nine verses. We're gonna wrap up Paul's letter with nine verses. And I'll be very honest with you. There's, a lot of not, there's not a lot of new information in these nine verses. Basically, he's just recapping the letter that we have taught all summer. But even beyond that, he's actually recapping the story of the gospel. And so today, here's what I've loved as I've prepared and as I've studied and praying for this, I've seen that, man, these are incredible reminders for us. And it's valuable to be reminded of principles because it's easy to forget the foundations of our faith. Remembering is actually really good, no matter if we're remembering good or bad things. Hey, let me remind us of a year that, that, that we've experienced. There was a year, now let me know if you know what year this is, where a virus broke out all across the world. And the virus broke out in an Asian country and actually spread all over the world. And there was a lot of controversy. I don't know if you knew this, about masks and vaccines. And in the same year, there was an African-American man who was, who was killed in the streets that led to days, weeks, and months of civil unrest and riots and anger and protests. That there was an election presidential election that happened that pretty much divided our nation. 
Because there's a lot of question on who's the rightful president, who should be the president, who should we vote for, who should we not vote for. That, that there was a lot of pressure in this year for the United States just to stay out of the world's business and just bring all troops home and let's just worry about ourselves and not worry about other people. And oh yeah, by the way, in that same year, the Los Angeles Lakers went to the NBA finals with their newly acquired all-star free agent. Do you guys remember that year? Do you know what year I'm talking about? What year am I talking about? You would think I'd be talking about 2020, but I'm not. I'm talking about 1968. Then in 1968, there was a virus called the H3N2 virus, more commonly known as a Hong Kong flu, simply because the first reported case was in Hong Kong and there was conversations about masks and vaccines. There was an African-American man that was killed in the streets that caused days, weeks, and months, and in this context, years of civil unrest, protests, and violence. But I'm not talking about George Floyd, I'm talking about Martin Luther King Jr., the political divide in the, surrounding the election was not Donald Trump and Joe Biden. Lyndon B. Johnson had just announced that he's not gonna run for re-election, which caused both Republicans and Democrats to, to scramble to see who can they provide to be the next president of the United States. And so there was a lot of division and a lot of controversy and Richard Nixon actually became the next president. The, 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 the unrest around the world and the pressure of the United States to stay out of the world's business was not Afghanistan or the different things that we see today, but it was the Vietnam War that was at its beginning stages. And yes, Los, An- Los Angeles Lakers, they went to the NBA finals with their newly acquired free agent, all-star, not LeBron James, but Wilt Chamberlain. And so I share all of that not to give us a history lesson, but to give us this picture that it is good to remember because when we remember, we realize there are people that have experienced things that have gone before us. And it was the historian and the the philosopher, George Santayana, who seems to be ascribed as the first one to say, those who do not learn from history are doomed to repeat it. And so today we are gonna be simply reminded of some foundational truths in scripture. If you've walked with Jesus, if you are a Christian, call yourself a Christian, then these are truths that really you may have heard, but I hope to articulate them in a way that they'd really resonate with our hearts. And remember that goodness is found in Jesus and only Jesus. You see, Galatians in this letter has freedom written all over it. And earlier in this series, we have walked through the pictures, the stories and the, and, and, and the verses. It was Jesus himself that said that John recorded If I, Jesus, if I set you free, you will be free indeed. Paul, when he started the previous chapter, chapter five, verse one, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. It seems like a relationship with Jesus is intended to set us free and for us to experience freedom. It's a natural result of faith in Jesus, but that's not always how it works out. Unfortunately, there's often a gap between what we expect in faith and what we experience. And so Paul wrote with this exact thing in mind as he wrote this letter to the Galatians, helping them understand what it, how can they experience this freedom that is truly found in Jesus? In a lot of ways, the reality, this this letter has a lot of the answers to the questions and the divisions that we have in our culture and the divisions we have within the church. So that's why this letter is so important. That's why we spent the entire summer taking a look at it. So let's take a look. If you have a Bible with you, if you're at home checking out online, if you're here with us, if you have a Bible, open it. If you have your app, go ahead and go to your app. Go to Galatians chapter six is where we're gonna be. Galatians chapter six, verse 11. Paul starts off, he says, see what large letters I use as I write to you with my own hand. Now that's, that's a little weird. So he starts off and it's not that like Paul is like writing this and he's like, I'm just gonna write really big at this point. What's happening is he presumably is, he's dictating this letter. He's dictating this to a scribe. That's how letters were usually done. And the scribe was writing down everything that he, is, he wanted to say to the Galatians. And it's almost like Paul is like, I'm so passionate about these last nine verses. I'm so passionate about closing this letter right. I just gotta do it myself. So give me that tablet. I'm just gonna write it myself. And so he says, see what large letters I use. I write with my own hand, not the scribes. And he starts off verse 12. Those who want to impress people by means of the flesh are trying to compel you to be circumcised. 
Now, don't lose me there. I know that's a little bit weird. We'll talk about it. The only reason they do this is to avoid being persecuted for the cross of Christ. Here's what's happening. Some of you might be like, I knew Christians were weird. I come in and they start talking about circumcision. I get it. We are weird, but not because of this. All right, there's a lot of other reasons why we are weird. What circumcision is and what Paul is referencing in the Old Testament, God had given the people of Israel a number of laws, 613 laws to be exact. There were 613 laws that were set out and those laws were to show what it means for God's people to be holy. Not because God is an angry God, but because God is like, hey, I wanna be in relationship with my people, but because of sin and brokenness and evil, it's in our world, there is a gap between us and I want my people back. But for us to be in relationship because God is holy, we too have to be holy. And so these standards were set out. And the first time something like this was exposed was with a man named Abram, who we know as Abraham. And God made a covenant with him. And the outward display of this covenant was circumcision. What God was doing was saying, you are now not gonna be identified like everybody else. And the core of who you are as a man is now gonna be marked so the world would know, so that you would know you do not belong to this world, but yet you belong to me, that my people will be marked with this covenant. And so the word circumcision was simply about this idea of being an outward marker for God's people to be identified as followers of him. In the first century, when Paul is referencing, writing this, Jews would reference circumcision as a reference to following the law of Moses. And, and, and the law was intended to, to help us understand what it means to be in relationship with him. But the religious leaders, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, what they would do is they would actually take that law and they would control people. They would lord it over people. And so this thing called legalism began. And we've talked about this here a few weeks ago, that this thing called legalism entered into the world, that the old covenant was based on following the rules of the law how you were behaving, legalism. But the new covenant of Jesus is not about how you are behaving, but it's about we now belong because of what Christ has done on the cross. Let me break it down this way. Legalism says, if you believe the right thing and if you behave a certain way, then you belong to God's family, you're a child of God. That's what legalism said. If you believe and behave, then you belong. But grace, Jesus tells us, that's actually not what it takes. Some of us have heard John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. That the work of the gospel is not believing and behaving. The work of the gospel, gracism, not legalism, gracism says we believe first. And when you believe, then you belong. And when you belong, God gives you this gift called the Holy Spirit, his own presence in our lives. And his Holy Spirit will guide us as we learn what it means to behave in his name. So in verse 13, Paul continues, hey, I just wanna remind you, not even those who are circumcised keep the law, yet they want you to be circumcised that they may boast about your circumcision in the flesh. You see, he's calling out the religious leaders saying, hey, not even the legalists, not even those that, that say that you've got to follow the rules, they can't even follow the rules to a T. Like they want you to do this. They want you to follow the rules. They can't even keep the law themselves, yet they want you to be circum. They want you to follow the law so that they may boast about your circumcision in flesh. So they might boast about how you're acting. You see, what, what Paul is saying is these religious leaders, they're just trying to get as many followers to follow the rules and act a certain way just to make themselves look better. And friends, if that is not an indictment on the local church, that's an entirely different sermon that we could dive into. But Paul is saying, watch out for the motives of these religious leaders. They want you to look like you're following God because it'll look better for them. See, it's really easy to fall into legalism because legalism's easy. All legalism is, hey, tell me the boxes to check. What do I do? I'll, do, I'll know exactly where I stand. Legalism is clean. Grace is messy. And this is why we're diving into this thing called Galatians, because the most precious thing that we have 
is our position of being in Christ and our posture of worship before the cross. And I wanna break that down for us. The greatest, the greatest thing that we have as believers is our position in Christ and our posture before Jesus because that's what gives us victory in this life. That's what allows us to experience freedom, being in Christ and our posture before the cross. The problem is we have an enemy that really doesn't like that. That we have a common enemy, Satan, the thief who comes. And Jesus says that Satan comes for three reasons. He's got three purposes. That's it. Jesus, uh, Satan just has three things that he wants to do. You know what it is? John records it for us. Jesus says the thief comes only to steal, to kill, and destroy. That's it. You can wrap up all the schemes of the evil one in those simple three words, to steal, to kill, and destroy. And Jesus says, but I have come not to make sure people act a certain way, not to make sure people listen to K-Love, not to make sure people wear crosses, not to be, make sure that people post the right things on their Instagram, that I have come so that you might have life and actually have an abundant life. Satan's got three purposes, steal, kill, and destroy. Jesus has one to give us abundant life. And we experience this abundant life. We become like him and we join him on mission. And it's important for us to be reminded of the things that Paul is, is, is closing this letter with. Because a lot of us have misunderstood the Christian life. We've trivialized it. We've made it about a certain set of standards and a certain set of rules. And if we're not careful, we're gonna view the Christian life as a life improvement strategy. If I just do this, 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 and this, then I'm going to have a better life. That's not why Jesus came. Jesus did not come so that we might have a better life. He didn't come to improve our lives. This is what the religious leaders wanted to do. They wanted people to, re, to respond and, and, and act a certain way. But Paul says, you missed the point. It's for something completely deeper. The Christian life is not about us acting, talking, and living a certain way. There's a much deeper experience that Jesus has for us. You see, I think one of the core problems that I've experienced in my faith, and I'm just gonna say, I'm just gonna indict myself. And if any of y'all wanna jump on the train, you guys can as well, all right? One of the biggest problems I have in my faith is I've completely misunderstood this idea of grace. Because I've gotten to the place where I believe that I must live for Jesus. And if I live for God and let the other people outside know that I live for God, then I'm quote unquote doing my job. You see, when we find ourselves in a place where we're living for Jesus, we find ourselves in a place where we're trying to perform a certain way, we're literally living a performance-based faith. And a performance-based faith always leads us to two things. It always leads us to arrogance, or apathy. That a lot of times we view our lives and saying, man, look how great I'm doing. I can check all the boxes. I do all the right things. My kids go to the right schools. Everyone thinks of me in a certain way. I'm doing everything right. We can walk around with some spiritual arrogance. Or maybe the flip side is where I probably guess most of us are. I just can't do it. I have tried, I've tried, I've tried this Christian life. I tried to do it right and I just fall short. Forget it. I'm out. I want nothing to do with that Christian life any longer because I just feel like a failure. You see, that's apathy. It doesn't matter if we're arrogant in our faith or if we're apathetic. When we have a performance-based life, we think Christianity and our walk with Jesus is all about how good I can do or how poorly I have done. The focus of our faith becomes me in my actions. And when the focus of my faith becomes me in my actions, guess who is not the focus of my faith? Jesus. Many of us have fallen into this trap of understand, thinking that our life is all about our performance. And here's the problem with living a performance-based life. When we live a performance-based life, we try to act a certain way because we think it's gonna give us something, but we come up against this evil one who comes to steal, kill, and destroy that there are spiritual forces that prevent us from experiencing these things. And not only do they prevent us from experiencing these things, many of us have already experienced things and we feel like the gospel is not able to help us with any of this. That's my story. I met Jesus when I was 19 years old as a college athlete at Colorado State University. That's how I met Jesus. 
But you see, the problem with that is I had 19 years before that of things that I'd done wrong. I mean, there's some things I look back at my past, childhood trauma. I was sexually abused as a young young boy. Mistakes that I made in high school and in college to that point, even not just to that point, even after I became a Christian, I made some some stupid choices for the rest of my college years. And even when I became a pastor, I'm embarrassed looking back at some of the things that I've engaged with. And I'm a victim of this performance-based living because here's when you're performance-based, this is what happens. Your self-worth is all based upon how well or how poorly you're performing. So that actually becomes my identity. My self-worth plummets because my entire life and my faith is based on how well or how poor I am doing things. And inevitably, because of all of this, we end up grabbing some labels. There's some things that come on our lives and some things that we just start to believe about ourselves. And I don't know about you, but I've carried around a whole lot of these kinds of labels that for me, one of the labels that I carry around is I've been abused. Or you know what? I actually feel kind of worthless. I made a lot of mistakes. I'm, I'm pretty worthless. I actually view myself in a lot of ways sometimes. I'm just broken. Anyone relate to any of this? You know, I'm broken. I've made mistakes. I'm actually unlovable. And I'm unlovable and because I feel like I'm unlovable, I prevent people from getting close to me. And I've actually missed out on a whole lot of great relationships because I feel like I was unlovable. But then it's not just the negative labels. I mean, in a lot of ways, my family, we've experienced the quote unquote American dream. Came as immigrants to this country, went to college, got a degree, met Jesus, you know, have a family, have 2.3 kids and a dog and a white picket fence and became a pastor and chaplain and NFL team. Like if I'm not careful, it's not just these, these negative labels that we place on ourselves, but in a lot of ways, it's these positive labels of success. It's these positive labels of being an achiever. That for a lot of us, we walk around with these labels because we live such a performance-based life that we've actually allowed all of these labels. Uh Uh-oh. We've actually allowed all of these labels to define us. And we walk around thinking that this is all that defines us, these things that we've done good or these things that we've done bad. And you and I find ourselves in a place of, man, I'm either all good or I'm all bad. You see, the apostle Paul understood this. He had some labels as well. I mean, he himself in that culture, I mean, he was from the right lineage. I mean, he was a Jew. Not only a Jew, he was from the tribe of Benjamin. Like that's the tribe that you wanna be from if you want power and influence. He was incredibly religious. In a lot of ways, he was an achiever. But then Jesus happened. And then, but you know, but Jesus is like the greatest phrase, but Jesus, those words um, show up 128 times in the 27 books of the New Testament. But Jesus intervened and Paul got a new label that Paul got to, got to get rid of these labels. And he got sent out on a brand new mission with God. You see, but here's the thing. You and I, we walk around with these kinds of labels. We walk around these labels and the problem is, especially when we hang on to our positive labels, we think our positive labels, they define us. When that happens, our self-esteem goes up and our self-esteem goes down based on whether or not we're living this label well. You see, the problem is you and I, we cannot remove these labels on our own. For a lot of us, we're so used to this, this actually becomes a part of our identity. Am I connecting with anyone here? That this becomes our identity. And we have no idea how to, how to shed this identity any longer because this is what we walk around with. But Jesus, but Jesus gives us this thing called grace. Grace literally means just simply getting something that you don't deserve. So Jesus at the cross, he gives us this grace and grace is the glue that holds the gospel together. So on the cross, something amazing happens. On the cross, Jesus actually becomes our sin so that we can experience the righteousness of God. So instead of us trying to pull these labels off, Jesus gives us an invitation. 
And here's what the invitation is. It doesn't matter if it's a positive label of scholar and successful, like in Paul's perspective. It doesn't matter if you feel like you're unlovable or if you're worthless, like many of us in this room. All of this, Jesus says, why don't you just simply lay that on the cross? Some of us have the abused or damaged label that we have on ourselves. And we, Jesus says, just give me that. Let my grace cover you. You don't have to be known by that. You don't have to be known as being broken because here's what happens at the cross. At the cross, Jesus says, you give me your worst. At the cross, you give me your worst and I'll give you my best. So there's a great exchange that happens at the cross. Instead of these labels, we get to exchange these labels that we feel like defined us. And Jesus says, why don't you give me the worst of yourself at the cross? And I'm actually gonna give you something great. I'm gonna give you my best. So he covers us in something completely different with completely different labels. And the labels that he gives us at the cross are grace and mercy, child of God, redeemed, restored. You see, that's what happens at the cross. He says, give me your worst and I'll give you my best. And his identity becomes ours because we are in Christ and Christ is in us. Do you know why the church sings this song, Amazing Grace, for hundreds of years? First of all, because grace is pretty amazing. Second of all, because we need to be reminded of this. Many of us have walked around in church as Christians with these labels. When the invitation of the cross is, you don't have to live with those labels any longer. Give me your worst, I'll give you my best. And when that happens, he gives us this power to live this abundant life. This power is called the Holy Spirit. <coughs> and the Holy Spirit is our proof that we belong to God. This is how Paul continues the scripture in Galatians, verse 14. May I never boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. He's saying, may I never boast in my actions, all the things I've done good, all the things I've done bad. May I boast in nothing else but the cross of Christ through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. Now listen to this, verse 15. Neither circumcision or uncircumcision means anything. It doesn't matter if you follow the rules. It doesn't matter if you follow the law. It doesn't matter if you don't. Those aren't primary. Those are things we can work on later. What matters, what counts is the new creation. That the point of the cross is new creation. The point of what Paul is talking about is new creation. The point of the gospel is new creation. Not what we listen to, not how we vote, not where our kids go to school, not how we look to other people, not what we, point, what we post. What counts is new creation that is found only in the cross of Christ. That's what counts for us. This is how Paul said it to the Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, that position, remember that position I talked about? Anyone is in Christ, if you believe you are in Christ, if anyone is in Christ, they are a new creation. The new creation has come. The old is gone, the new is here. Listen to how the Living Bible, another translation, listen to these words. I love this paraphrase. I love these words. When someone becomes a Christian, he, and she, he or she becomes, becomes a brand new person inside. He is not the same anymore. She is not the same anymore. A new life has begun. Like that word new creation in the Greek, guess what it means? A new creation, like something that is brand new, something that is not tainted and something that people had never seen before. And so when you trust in Jesus, when we trust in Jesus, we're not better, we're brand new. We are completely regenerated into something that has never been seen before, a brand new person on the inside. You see, legalism tries to change the actions and hoping the heart gets impacted. The gospel transforms and restores our heart. And from there, the rest of our life permeates. If there's anything that we've misunderstood about the gospel, the gospel tells us that Jesus did not come to make bad people good. He came to bring dead people to life, abundant life, true life, the way that life was intended to be. 
And some of us might be sitting in this place and thinking to ourselves, man, I've messed up too much. You don't know my story. My story's got labels like no other, like worthless and sinner and orphan and addict and failure and fearful. And we think there's no way, there's no way that that's true for me. But can I remind us of something? Jesus is a much better forgiver than you are sinner. Listen to how Paul said this to the Romans. Again, this is another paraphrase. You think anyone's gonna be able to drive a wedge between us and Christ's love for us? There's no way. Not trouble, not hard times, not hatred, not hunger, not homelessness, not bullying threats, not backstabbing, not even the worst sins listed in scripture. None of this phases us because Jesus loves us. And I'm absolutely convinced that nothing, nothing living or dead, angelic, demonic, today, tomorrow, high, low, thinkable or unthinkable, absolutely nothing can get between us and God's love because of the way Jesus, our master, has embraced us. Grace, getting something we don't deserve. So not only are we marked with grace, we're marked with mercy. Because if the law was still intact, if Jesus had never come, what we would deserve is separation. If grace is getting something we don't deserve, mercy is not getting actually what we do deserve. That's why we say the gospel is dripping with grace and mercy. And here's the great thing about God's mercy. God's standard of who deserves mercy is low. He doesn't have a very high standard for who deserves mercy. You and I have pretty high standards. C.S. Lewis once said that we're gonna be, we're all gonna be surprised by two things when we get to heaven. First, we're gonna be surprised about people that are there that we knew for sure weren't gonna be there and people who aren't there that we thought for sure would be there. See, when mercy finds us, you get a clean slate. I work with athletes for a living. I've shared that with you. Here's the thing interesting about working with athletes. And this isn't just athletes, this, this translates in, in business and all those other areas, but I focus on this one little area. Every single thing an athlete does on the court, on the field, in the pool, on the track, wherever they can be, every single thing they do determines their worth to a team or an organization. Literally, could you imagine every single action determining your worth, giving people that kind of power? Like that is pressure. Like this is, I'll say this in the NFL, this is like one of the two worst times for any NFL player. The first one is the draft where everyone's like cheering on your replacement. Like, thanks for your service. See you later. We're excited about this 19 year old. <laughs> and preseason, when about 85% of people are fighting for jobs, don't know if they're gonna be able to feed their family, don't even know what they're gonna do after the game. Let me just speak straight to teenagers or students, not just teenagers, but students. We live in a world, you live in a world like no time before. Like your entire worth is so wrapped up in what people think about you. Do you have the right friends? Do you have enough followers? Do people like your posts? Do you have a high enough snap score on Snapchat? Like, like your life is all dependent upon how do other people view you? And we've experienced that in other generations, but nothing like this generation. But can I remind students, can I remind all of us, and maybe some of us that find ourselves finding our worth and our performance in our work? Do you know how you can tell how much something is worth? How much somebody is willing to pay for that item? Do you know how much you are worth? You're worth so much that Jesus paid his life for you. That's what worth is. That's why the gospel is dripping with grace and mercy. That's why the label of child of God is already on. We don't have to earn it. That's what Paul's trying to say. And as I've been thinking and wrapping up this series, I had this question in my mind and posed, and we were talking about this with a few others on staff. What does it look like? Like, what does it truly mean to live free? Like, how do we experience freedom? I believe we experience freedom when we're free from condemnation. When we're so secure in this idea that I am accepted and I am loved, that literally it doesn't matter what people say or what I experience, I am secure. To me, that's freedom. And it's exemplified in this video clip. I want you to watch this clip of this Little League baseball player and his coach. And I'll come back and pray and we'll be done. 
Finally tonight, the young pitcher and the pep talk from his coach heard by millions. It's the biggest game of their young lives. Game from South Williamsport, Pennsylvania, the, first the Little League team from Bend, Oregon, in a battle with a team from Italy. Isaiah Bugsy Jensen on the mound. Hi, my name is Bugsy Jensen. I'm my favorite baseball player. It's Clayton Kershaw. 12-year-old Isaiah pitching a great game until he gets a little tired in the top of the fifth. Now he can take his base. Out comes his coach for a pep talk. But that coach just happens to be Bugsy's dad. I just came out to tell you how much I love you. As a dad and a player, okay? You're doing awesome out here. One more hitter and then I'm going to Juge. This is your last hitter, okay? You understand? Come right after. Hey, cheer up. Have some fun. Come right after. Okay? Let's go. One more batter before Bugsy's replaced. That pep talk from dad worked. Another strikeout, and the team goes on to win. And that's going to do it. Victory from nine players from Bend, Oregon, and one very proud dad. Here's why I love that video. That boy was on the mound, and he was struggling. I mean, he had pitched a pretty good game, but he was just waning. Man, his arm was getting tired, and the balls were not going where he wanted them to go any longer. Could you imagine being 12 years old? The entire world is watching. And you're not doing well? Imagine what kind of self-talk's going on in his mind. Man, I'm terrible. What am I doing here? It's so embarrassing. How could I? I'm letting everybody down. And then he sees his coach slash dad come out. And the first things his dad says is what? I just want to know I love you as a son and as a player. Changes everything. That's grace. You know what legalism would have sounded like? Coach slash dad coming out. What are you doing? Like, you're terrible. I can't believe you're throwing the ball this way. I didn't teach you to do that. You shouldn't even be on this team. Look at you. You're letting all of us down. That's what legalism says. That's what we experience sometimes from other believers, if we were honest. That's why it's important for us to listen to the voice of the Father. And unfortunately, the voice of other people is loud. The voice of the Father is whisper because we hear it when we're closest to him. You know what he's whispering? I love you. We can worry about the strikes. We'll bring in another pitcher. You're going to be fine. And then that boy went out and he struck out that other batter. And I believe the only reason he struck out that batter is because his father came out and alleviated all of his anxiety by simply saying, dude, I love you. I could care less about your performance. You're my son. I love you. Let's do this together. We'll bring in somebody else. We'll win this game. I wonder if some of us just simply needed to hear. We have a heavenly father that says that. But I love you. I just want to be in relationship with you. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for who you are. Thank you for your grace and your mercy. Thank you that as we close these words in Galatians, that we can... Let them sink into our hearts and our souls. This is how Paul, just sit quiet, close your eyes, just listen to these words from Paul. Peace and mercy to all who follow this rule, this principle, this idea of new creation is the point to the Israel of God. From now on, let no one cause me trouble for I bear on my body the marks of Jesus. And in verse 18, I'm gonna change some of the words. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ Be with you, Mission Hills. Amen.